All right. I'll give it a couple more minutes yet. Also, I've never taught this book. Um, I actually tend to only pick books that I've never taught just because that's how I learn. So, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. And uh, the idea for this came out of, what was that? Oh, it was in the context of the daily prayer because uh, we read 1 Corinthians, was that last week maybe or two weeks ago? And then um, I'm trying to think what the other, con oh, and then all the discussion about the Lord's Supper that's come out of um, the con this context of just, you know, what do we do? And um, the synod's all over the map and uh, internationally, it's just, it's the same. And um, the non-Lutherans are doing their own thing. And it's interesting to see what the Roman Catholics did and then um, what the, um, now what the Orthodox are doing as well. Uh, depending on which country you're in. So I think it's worth kind of considering some more of a practical book, which is Corinthians is more practical than it is dogmatic um, and see how Paul interacts with it, what was going on in their real world. All right. So I guess I'm doing an introduction already. Might as well dig in. So um, first Corinthians, let's start with uh, prayer. And then if anybody else joins us, that's great. Looks like we lost Barb. Maybe she'll come back all right we're still here <laughs> yeah no that's good like i said i'll record it and then anybody who couldn't join us live can uh, listen to it or watch it in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen, amen. amen. heavenly father you um, gather us around your word to be nurtured and fed um, with that word which is our only source of, of life and hope uh, and resurrection we ask that uh, you would guide us by your spirit, that we'd be faithful to it, that we would understand what you would have us learn um, from, from your apostle, and that uh, it would reflect then in our lives as a church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I left your mic on because it's just the two of us for now. If it gets too right. noisy, I'll mute you. <laughs> Okay. So, um, so by way of introduction, I don't know, Barb, maybe Barb had to take a call or something. Oh, well. Or internet. Uh, I was going to share with you um, the introduction. There she's back. Well, not quite yet. Connecting audio. Now she's back. Okay. Hi, Barb. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Sorry. <I'm there. laughs> That's all right. You just missed the prayer. So, you know, oh. no, no big problem. Um, <laughs> it's all right. So, the recording later. <laughs> yeah, okay. watch the recording later. So um, some basic introductory stuff, which we kind of need just to get context. Um, Paul was converted in AD 36 or so, you know, so the figure, um, you know, about somewhere around the, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, right? Appears on Damascus Road because he's been persecuting Christians. Um, as far as the, the dating of the resurrection, I think it's usually said as AD 33, but um, over the last... I would say probably 150 years, even 100 years. Um, that date has has fluctuated plus or minus about three years, depending on the Herods and um, and whatnot. So anyway, it's somewhere around 8036 is kind of where the current scholarship puts his conversion. He he plants the church in Corinth and he stays there for two years uh, between 8049 and 8051. So it's about what would that be? Doing the math, 40, 13 years after his conversion. All right, so this is already then after the um, the Jerusalem Council in Acts between Peter and Paul, you know, over the relationship of Jew and Gentile, um, which is really more at play, I would say, in, say, Romans and in Galatians, those two books, especially Galatians, dealing with Jew and Gentile relationship among Jewish Christ, formerly Jewish Christians and now formerly Gentile Christians. Um, not so much the deal in, in, in this book, in Corinth. Uh, because Corinth is a pagan Gentile city. Um, so that, that whole, oh, should, should we go back to circumcision or not, that kind of thing, that's not really <laughs> play in this book so much, uh, which is helpful for us. So, what was that, Barb? He's, what are we studying? Corinthians? First Corinthians, yep. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sorry, that was in, was that in the email? And maybe it wasn't. I don't even know. No, you probably said it when I was gone. Oh, that's happened. right. That's right. You were gone. Okay. Um, so <laughs> well, I wasn't. My computer was. <laughs> your computer was gone. 
Uh, this was on his second missionary journey. And if you have a study Bible, I don't have one in front of me, but they have, um, yes, they, they'll have maps and you'll see, uh, it's, it's pretty, I mean, he gives a lot of landmarks and we have uh, people that he meets, meets like Roman um, officials, especially, and we know their dates. So we can really get a pretty good idea when he was where. All right. Um, so he, but he does stay in one place for a little while. So he's in Corinth for two years from 49 to 51. Um, and then he goes on, on a third journey from Corinth or from thereabouts. Uh, and then probably either sometime on that journey or uh, when he gets back to kind of his home base, which is, uh, what was that island's name? I don't remember. It's not Patmos, but it's over there. Um, that he, he writes to the church in Corinth because he's received word about um, some issues there. <laughs> it's kind of like, it reminds me of like a retired pastor, you know, who kind of keeps an eye out on the congregations that he served. You know, and then um, sometimes they do insert themselves and give an opinion. So, um, but Paul was a, you know, he was a missionary planter. So it's a little bit different context, right? Um, or he doesn't interfere so much with the pastors he puts in place. Um, but maybe at their request, um, they ask for his wisdom. So he's, he's serving more like a bishop in our, that would be what we'd call them, an overseer of, of the pastors there. All right, so. He's writing back to a church that he actually served for two years as a as a mission, you know founding pastor missionary pastor, which I think is is helpful that to understand that relationship. Um, Corinth is a crazy town. I don't. I'm trying to think. We really in the Western world don't have anything equivalent to this, where you have kind of three things that are the primary you know life of the town um, next door to each other. It actually kind of reminds me of my um, my vicarage congregation which when it was founded, there were, there were basically three landmarks. Um, there was the home, you know, each individual home, there was the church, and then there was um, the town hall, which was also the bar. And so, so, so there, there are town hall meetings in the bar, which I, you can debate the wisdom of that. And then, and then they had the church and then, and then the homes, right? And that's how they intentionally built their community, this, which was a missionary community to, um, I think the Chippewa Indians there in Michigan. And, um, and so, so in Corinth, what they had is they had, they had the pagan temples, they, and they had the marketplace or the Agora as it's called in Greek. And then they had the, um, like the Basilica. So like the town hall was the Basilica and these play, things interacted with each other. So the, the politicians would be found, you know, in the marketplace, but then the, the, the pagan temples would need the marketplace to buy their meat or actually to sell their meat back that was sacrificed at the temple. And so these, that was the whole life, you know, was centered in these kind of three, uh, what do you want to say, estates or something like that. So um, kind of a, a, a strange dynamic. I'm trying to think of one where we have, where we have church and then commerce and then state kind of all thrown together interacting. And nothing came to mind when I was brainstorming that. So maybe that, that context is a little challenging for us. By the way, there is a chat feature here too. I don't have the chat window open. Uh, I don't see it. <laughs> maybe I have chat turned off. Okay. Well, I've got your mics open, so you can just yell at me if you need me um, to take, take a question. Because there's also the raised hand feature, but I don't know where that is either. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else would I want to talk about to kind of give us an insight? Well, it's pretty law heavy. I think that's important to note um, because of, I mean, this is Paul writing to a church that's um, got issues, uh, practical issues. And maybe one way to summarize it, to think about this is that uh, what, what's happening in that church is it's fracturing into, into individual sects, right? So um, here's, here's the people who followed after the teaching that Paul gave us. And then Here's the ones who are following after Apollos, for example, or following after these new super apostles that have shown up, these new apostles, false prophets, and, and the church is fracturing. And the reason that's fracturing apart um, is actually because their doctrine is fracturing. So <laughs> the, teaching, the teaching is what's being broken up. And so then they don't um, also, um, sh that, that's actually the source of their unity as a church. And that's still true today. Uh, this is a, I think this has actually played its way out in the in the more liberal denominations where you see, um, you know, where they try to have the big tent, <laughs> if you like, you know, where everybody's under the tent. And, well, we can have people like that. And then we can have people who hold to this teaching 
Um, what would be a good example of this? Well, the ELCA is as far as Lutherans, but like the United Church of Christ would be one. We have one of those here in town. Um, I think who's another big tent kind of kind of church. The, the Episcopalians are that way, you know, where you can be a Wiccan priestess <laughs> and be an Episcopalian. You're like, how's that going to work? Any thoughts on that? I should have just let you answer. No? So, um, yeah, because what ends up happening, maybe just to explain that a little further, is what ends up happening is that if everybody has a kind of a different set of doctrine, the only thing that actually unites you is either your agreement to disagree with one another, which isn't an agreement at all, I suppose, um, but act, you just have to distill things down to what is the only thing that we have in common, and then that's the source of our unity, right? So if our, if our source of unity, the thing we have in common, um, you know, is in those liberal more churches, and this was happening in Corinth, the only thing they could probably agree upon was that we should be good people, you know, we should generally love one another, um, that we should be kind and gentle, virtuous, that kind of thing. You know, the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, that that's the only thing they have left, but it's not faith in Christ. Um, it's certainly not uh, their practice of the Lord's Supper or even baptism, likely. Um, so uh, I want to read you a little something. And this is maybe to describe that setting in a little bit more Oh, well, vividly. This is from the uh, Lutheran Study Bible, that new edition, but I think it's helpful. A variety of shops line the walls of the marketplace or mycelium. Along with people bartering in Greek, Latin, and other tongues, hogs grunt, sheep and goats bleat, chickens cluck, doves cow, or coo, I guess, right, and cattle low. The animals smell and see fresh produce and baked goods close to their pens. The smell of blood and cooked meat hangs in the air, wafting from the market area and from the dining halls in the nearby temples. Worshippers gather in the temple to make sacrifices, and businessmen recline at tables to discuss the latest issues, while uh, Asclepius and Serapis and other gods stand in mute approval. Outside these temples, members of a new piety walk past the temples to the uh, Maselum in search of food for a private supper to be hosted by their lord. The cosmopolitan markets of, at Corinth supplied a diverse population of settlers, travelers, and slaves. The interests and differences between these groups influenced the divisions in the house churches at Roman Corinth. Paul's letter provided detailed instructions about these dividing issues and directed the Corinthians to what he taught them before. Christ crucified unites all who believe. So when the author of, of the uh, study Bible notes uh, wrote this, I'm thinking, this sounds a lot like those wet markets in Wuhan. I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> For you? Yeah. With, yeah. With, 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 there's butchered animals, there's cooking animals, there's live animals, there's other food. It's all Good like... Way to start the disease. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, but, but the important note there was the bit about the, the temples and then the businessmen and then having the mute gods, meaning their statues, right? And, and the two gods that the author mentioned are interesting because uh, one is a, is a Greek god. Now, this is a Roman city, but it's a Greek god. The other god, Serapis, that's actually, um, that's an Ethiopian, or not Ethiopian, excuse me, Egyptian god, Egyptian god. So these, these cities were very cosmopolitan because of the Roman Empire and the way that, you know, the road, the Roman roads um, allowed, you know, religious even activities to move from place to place. So... Uh, and Luther has similar things to say as well, just, but um, maybe we can read that another time. Let's actually look at the book. So here's the fun time. Uh, if you've got your screen, I'm going to flip it so that you can see the text. And uh, da, 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 there we go. And click share. And now you should be able to see the Bible text. Is that working for everybody? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Well, the internet's a wonderful thing, right? You don't see it? I do. You do. It just Our popped best. up. All right, good. Yeah, I don't know what the time delay is. And I think I think what uh, Zoom tries to do is make sure the audio is as synchronous as possible, but it's willing to let video lag um, if necessary. <laughs> so uh, what I did with the, uh, with the third and fourth grade children, because this whole thing is like trying to figure out how to do things without actually being in each other's presence, is I actually listened to we listened to a recording and I'm trying to find it now. 
of um, of the text. Uh, I've got a, a kind of a fun one, and I'll just find it here. How do I make it so I can see all of these results in li my library? Sorry, I didn't get this prepared ahead of time. All right, there's First Samuel, First Kings, Psalms, Isaiah, dun, 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 New Testament, Corinthian, Timothy, Philippians. There's First Corinthians. Okay, so the whole book. This is an interesting thing. The whole book of Corinthians, if you read it out loud dramatically, like this recording would take about an hour and 43 minutes to read out loud. Um, so uh, that's an important thing to note because <laughs> it actually is the longest of, of Paul's epistles. Uh, most of his epistles are quite a bit shorter. For example, I mean, even Galatians, you think, oh, Galatians, it's a, it's a massive book, right? Six chapters. Um, it only takes about 22 minutes to read Galatians. <laughs> Ephesians, I'm just doing the math here in my head. Oh, that's 22 minutes as well, right? But then you have you have 1 Corinthians, and it's, this can't be right. Oh, no, 1 Corinthians is an hour and three minutes, and then it's it's about 41 minutes for 2 Corinthians. So um, that tells you maybe Paul had a few things to say. So now that you can see the text, um, the version that I'm going to play, it's not, it's from New King James, um, but it's got some famous actors reading it, and I, I, I like what they do to it, so... Why don't we look at chapter 1 and we'll see how far we get into this. The first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. You can hear that, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Greetings from Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek <laughs> after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block and to the Greeks, foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, 
and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. All right, so there you go. They do such a good job reading. <laughs> Rather than trying to make you want one of you read over the internet. Uh, okay, so um, so you heard some of the themes that I talked about before, right? The um, this calling uh, to where is that call to be saints together? You see that in verse two, with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. This is kind of an interesting theme, isn't it? That Paul is saying um, that there isn't more than one church, you know, like we say in the creed, one holy, you know, Christian church or holy apostolic, Christian apostolic church. And uh, that Corinth, by by their behavior, by their actions, are actually separating themselves from the whole church. So you see that there. All right. Anything else strike your fancy just through that as you as you heard it read? It was hard for me to because the words weren't the same mm, okay i tried to just listen and then i kind of lost i mean not really lost it it was just it was i don't know it, it wasn't as connecting as when i read the words as if you were mm, okay well it, it's true it goes by pretty quick right and it was one thing i wanted to point point out and you remind me about it which is that um you know paul is unique in that unlike the other apostles uh, he doesn't come from well there there are some exceptions i suppose with matthew but uh, for the most part the apostles are common people and they speak with with common language um but then you see like in someone like saint luke and and in his we know this from the way that he constructs um, the greek in his you know in his writing both in luke and acts is that luke is is very well, he's very scientific. He writes, he writes clearly, um, concisely. Um, the, the grammar is, is perfect. <laughs> okay. And then you read somebody like, well, like Peter, and it's a little bit messy. Um, although we don't have a lot from Peter. Um, you read John and it's, it's very, um, it's high language. You know, he's, he's speaking lofty language. Now, Paul is different because Paul was, was both a Roman citizen. Uh, and so he was trained in in all the, the classical arts, so uh, what we today call the liberal arts. And so he was trained in not only grammar and logic, but in rhetoric and, and really well schooled at that. And then, um, and he actually talks about some of his teachers and his influences, but he, I mean, he even knows like Greek, Greek and Roman philosophers. Um, and then, uh, but he was also a Jew of Jews. So he, so he also, um, you know, this is like the super scholarly type of guy, right? Um, not unaware of people. I mean, he knows how to make tents, right? So, I mean, he's a common person in that sense. He's not living in an ivory tower, but, um, but then, he, so he understands the Jewish faith as well as any, as any rabbi, because he was trained by the best rabbis. Um, the rest, like Gamaliel was his name, the best guy around. So, um, so Paul's unique in that he has both, but what it also means is that he, he, he has, I'm trying to think how to say this. Well, he, he tries to explain complicated subjects, um, and, but he does it through, through the classical you know, uh, rhetoric techniques, which means that for us who aren't trained in, <laughs> in logic and rhetoric, 
um, for the most part anymore. I mean, I include myself in that. Um, we we have a hard time tracking because he he's making this very logical argument, and and he's he's really um, speaking not only clearly but also he's speaking in a complicated but clear way, if that makes sense. Uh, to the point where, like when I read Paul. Um, I read a sentence and then I stop <laughs> like, okay, what did he mean? What do those words mean? What's the construction there? Does that help Barb? To kind yes. of explain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's going by pretty quick in a recording and you're like, well, okay, well, what's the argument you're making? What are you trying to do here? The other thing he's doing, um, you know, there, there is a form of an epistle epistle, you know, epistles have a, a, a format and they're, they're, it's fairly actually consistent among all the epistles. There, you know, it's kind of like um, when I was in grade school, I was taught to write letters, and you, and you were supposed to put the uh, the uh, you know who you were addressing, um, then your or your address, and then who you were addressing, and then dear so and so, you know, and then you're supposed to use a comma, and then you're supposed to do like a greeting, I will greet you in the da da da. I, I was taught to do that, right? That there was a format for a letter um, that was like the common or conventional format, and Paul's following um, the one for epistles. And most of the, the epistles in the New Testament do this. And, and also those that aren't included in the New Testament, but that are written by, you know, the earliest Christians, the earliest uh, Christian church fathers. So, so he is also just kind of uh, checking off some boxes, I suppose, as he's going along um, to say, you know, to do the things that you're supposed to do. So, for example, first, who is writing? Paul, right? called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. So that's a co-author or co-signer, I guess is probably a better word for that, right? And then who's he writing to? To the church of God that is in Corinth. So if somebody like was you know, carrying the scroll, they could unroll the scroll and at the very top, they would see exactly, okay, it's from Paul, it's to Corinth. That's where I'm supposed to take this, right? Yeah. Um, but then he's writing to those. And, and what's really beautiful here is that, I mean, Paul, we know, is going to have some harsh words for, for this church, but he doesn't just go right after them, <laughs> like, you idiots. Um, no. <laughs> no, he actually um, commends to them, or he grounds them um, in their calling as, as baptized children of God, right? So he begins there uh, in their foundation as, as children of God, of, and, and namely in, in the suffering and death of Jesus, actually, uh, so that that's meant to kind of set the tone, I guess, as we'd say, or the context is saying, look, I'm, I'm a, your fellow Christians with me. I'm not disputing that. Right. And, and we're, that's not what this is going to be about. This is, this is admonition or correction coming from um, one Christian to another, but actually, you know, Paul has an authority here. Um, and maybe that's another theme to bring out. Uh, we'll see this play out as we read through the book, but um you know, at the, in the earliest days of the church, at least from what we read in Acts and elsewhere, there isn't a clear hierarchical, you know, or Episcopal kind of um, structure for the church. Those things work their way out over the first couple hundred years of the church, that for good order, you know, you see in Acts, um, it's not good for us to wait on tables, so then they appoint deacons to handle the distributions to the poor and to the widows, right? And then over time, um, you know, like especially beginning in the Church of Rome, um, you have like a mother church in the middle and then all the satellite churches throughout, you know, the villages around, and, and within Rome. And they submit to the the um, pastor who sits upon the seat there in, in the center of Rome. That's just and that happens in many of those metropolitan cities. So there's there's the city church and then the country churches and the country churches follow the city church. And that's where we get this kind of hierarchical structure. And then you have councils, church councils that come you know, uh, right away, first, second, third century, by the fifth century of like Nicaea. And in those councils, you find out that actually some people are more important than other people, <laughs> as far as being deferred to, not just for theological expertise, but just because of kind of the importance of the of the church that they serve. Maybe it's, it's Constantinople, or it's, um, uh, you got to think of some of these towns. Well, Rome, obviously, would be another one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can feel free to jump in if you think of one. <laughs> yeah, you know ancient church history. I know you do. Uh, <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, um, Cappadocia is another one. Anyway, some of these towns aren't aren't even there anymore. Okay, so so he starts off with a greeting, and then he says, "Grace to you." Can you see my cursor, by the way? 
Yes. Oh, yep. you can see my big arrow? Okay, that's good. Yep. All right. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So so a word of blessing. You know, like we start with a prayer, he starts with a blessing. Um, again, um, commending them to be who they are, those sanctified, that is, um, the holy ones, actually, is, is the Greek there, in Christ Jesus, called to be, again, holy saints together with those who in every place call upon the name of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice it's called, um, there's a note here about that online, Romans 1, yeah. Um, but it's, it, is, it is the Lord's doing that he's brought them together as a church. Okay. Now, then he says, I love the paragraph breaks here in ESV because I think they're helpful. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. So you'll see this in a lot of Paul's letters. First, he has a greeting, then a blessing, and then a thanksgiving, right? So he, again, this is not Paul buttering them up, <laughs> you know, for, for, for the rocky stuff that's going to come later. But he, I think he, he honestly, he sincerely wants them to remember who they are and the basis on which um, they should even listen to him, um, but also um, to heed the word of Jesus. <clears throat> So I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way, yeah, you were enriched. Well, that's an interesting word. Yeah, enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. That's not the right of confirmation, by the way. It's the fact that um, we actually can look to the confession of, of someone to indicate whether or not the Spirit is at work in them, all right? That doesn't mean they can't, they couldn't also be deceiving us, right? By saying the words that we want to hear, <laughs> right? But I can, this, this is a, a pastoral lesson and maybe you've heard it from me before, but um, I can only go by what people say because I don't know what they're thinking first and foremost. <laughs> I don't know what's in their heart. I don't know what they actually believe. Um, the only way I know, or I can, the only way I can act actually or, or judge is by the words that come out of someone's mouth. And maybe a little bit by facial expression, but that can be deceiving too, All right? So um, if they confess with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, then I say, then you're a Christian. And that's all I can say. You say, I'm sorry, pastor, please forgive me. I say, I forgive you in the name of Jesus, right? I, it's not my job to say, um, I can't, there's just no way, oh, no basis I can do this. Well, I'm not sure if you're really sorry. I know you said the words, but you got to prove it to me, right? Well, what's going to be a valid proof? <laughs> You know, how, you know, Don, you know, got to prove to me that you're really sorry. Well, what's that going to look like? I should ask Karen, actually. What does it look like when Don's <laughs> really, really He's sorry? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, well, that's true in every relationship, I guess, is the point there, too, right? Because um, you, you can't, you can't judge other people's heart. You can only judge um, their words and actions, so... And then go by whatever they say and do. That's that's it. <sighs> so, um, so he, what he's saying is that uh, at, in the time that he was there, he gave them the words of Christ, right? He preached to them the grace of the, the gifts of, of Jesus, um, and enriched them in all speech and knowledge. And they confirmed it by by their own confession, by their own actions, so that you are not lacking in any gift, right? So you, this is a really important theme. Sometimes we forget, uh, pastors forget this, I think it, we probably all forget this as a church, is that we have everything we need <laughs> to be Christians, all right? Everything um, that is necessary for faith and life has been given to us at all times. We're, ne we're never lacking, um, well, in Jesus, really, but in his word or in his blessings. The things that we consider that we lack, maybe like, oh, I don't know, attendance or, you know, a special building or... You just name all the things that we attach value to as Christians. And Paul's saying, you know, you've, you've got everything you need because it's already been delivered to you by the Spirit through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that's really comforting, right? That's what he's trying to do for them is to say, you're, you're ready um, and you can wait patiently <laughs> for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's uh, on, the second, on the last day, who will sustain you to the end right? So that who is going to sustain them? That's always a good grammatical thing to do. Who's doing the verbs? 
that's a rhetorical question, I suppose, but you see it. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who's going to sustain you to the end. You see that, right? Yeah, it's not about you sustaining yourself or you gaining all speech or knowledge or trying to acquire every gift. No, you've already received them, and he's at work in you to sustain you. In the end, guiltless is the ESV here. And I think when we heard when we heard the um, New King James, it was a different word, but I, I don't remember what that was. Uh, da, da, guiltless, right? Oh, blameless. Yeah, that was the other word. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And that day is that day of his coming again, which he just mentioned before. God is faithful. <laughs> See, he will sustain you to the end. God is faithful, in case you missed it, <laughs> by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right, so you're actually seeing the same theme here in verses 4 through 9 that we saw back in verses 1 through 3. I should really move this down to my other screen so it looks like I'm looking at the camera. All right, hopefully that didn't goof, you, goof it up. Screen sharing yeah, is paused. Sure. Yeah, it's okay. Well, resume share. Okay, should come back in a second. Uh, this is a different tool than what I use for the other thing. Did it come back? Yes. All right, good. So you see the same themes that we saw at the beginning, that you were called to be saints together. And then here at the end of uh, verse 9, you were called into the fellowship of his son, um, being guiltless there, that same idea as being a saint. So, I mean, like I said, I don't think Paul's buttering them up. I, I think he's emphasizing um, maybe not what he thinks about them or what they think about themselves, but what God has said about them, right? That external declaration from God, the forgiveness of sins and what it gives. All right. Good so far? Yep. Yep. All right. I don't want to belager it too much with grammar and whatnot, since it is a longer book and we'd be here forever if we did that. All right. So with language and all that, like I like to do, this word means this. <laughs> all right. Now, um, again, this is an epistolary form and I can't, that means just the format of an epistle. Sorry, I have to keep from using big words. Um, and I can't remember what this, what this is called in the classical epistle, right? But now he, he makes, makes this appeal, right? Uh, and again, he calls them brothers. So, um, there's all of this indication that he he wants them to know uh, before before he challenges them, uh, which is what he's going to do right here, that um, they are together in faith in Christ, that they are together guiltless, that is forgiven in Jesus Christ, and that the Lord will accomplish what he has promised um, both for, for Paul, but also for them. All right, so now he makes the appeal. And that word appeal, that one I do want to, Pericolao, yeah, um, this is, this word for appeal is the same word that John uses, and we'll hear in a couple weeks uh, for Easter, in the season of Easter. This is the word for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. You remember that word? Yeah. Yeah, I always, I always do it for the kids because um, I just remind them, it sounds like parakeet, but it's not a bird. <laughs> but if that helps you remember that the Holy Spirit is a paraclete because of the dove <laughs> and all of that, yeah, mnemonic device, sure. Um, the paraclete, the advocate, right, is another way that's translated, or the comforter, I think it's translated that way as well, right? So here he's advocating, um, this This is legal language, um, like like a, um, well, a, a lawyer is an advocate, right, today. There's other kinds of advocates, I'm trying to think, in a legal context. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes you'll have people, like third parties that come in, um, and and submit like um, uh, evidence or whatnot as an to advocate for in a case. So, in any case, that's what Paul's doing here. He's advocating, um, but to them on behalf of of Jesus, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the name, the second commandment, and uh, um, that's he he's saying what I'm going to say now to you as my brothers, and you could say brothers and sisters if you want to get gender neutral here. See. Or brothers and sisters in New Testament usage. <laughs> Delphoid brothers. Maybe we referred to as brothers and sisters. Okay, fine. Um, it's not just that they're his brothers, but that um, he's doing this now under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that he's speaking as uh, one sent by Jesus. So um, now that now you got to take him seriously, right? That's that's what that does. 
that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Uh, and judgment here is referring to judgment uh, in these matters, these practical matters that are at, at play in the church of Corinth. All right. So, so now we know, we know, we know what the broad context is, excuse me for this book. You know, the thing that he's needing to respond to is that this church is fracturing. And the reason is, is that they're not actually um, united together of the same mind. And the word there is, is noose. And um, they, they, they basically have, this is, again, the, um, they should have the same theological backbone, which he's just reemphasized for them. Uh, and then that theology should work its way out in practice uh, that is of the same mind and the same judgment, but it's not happening. So uh, he's going to tell us why in a bit. All right, now he tells us who, who told him. <laughs> There's a spy there. Uh, not a spy, but some a concerned member wrote to the district president. That's how this works out. <laughs> People do this, by the way. They do. They'll, they don't like their pastor. They don't like what he's saying, and they don't think they have... He's listening to them, and so then they write to a higher authority. So that's uh, Chloe's people. There's actually a lot of argument about who this Chloe person is uh, among all the way from the earliest uh, commentators uh, on the book, because I, I was looking at that in my ancient Christian commentary on scripture book, which is a nice book, um, that, uh, yeah, nobody knows who these people are. Uh, they, for a long time, they thought it was a place, not a, um, not a person, but... I think today, because it's a common name that they went with the person, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Hmm. You guys are not getting along. What I mean is that each of you says, and so here's the nature of their division. Um, there's different cults of personality. There's Paul, there's Apollos, there's Cephas, also known as, what's his other name? Anybody know? Uh, this is Peter, by the way. Cephas. Yeah. Remember, he's yeah, he's the rock as well. He's Petros, um, but he's also Cephas. He's the head, right? And which is one of the reasons why the Roman church says he's the head of the church and the first pope and all of that. Because <laughs> yeah. the name means head. Well, anyway. Uh, and I follow Christ. As if this is somehow different, right? Like, hmm, what would be an equivalent today? Well, um, well, I imagine it would be like this. Uh, there's probably, you know, people in our congregation. Well, I follow, you know, the the teaching of, just name one of the previous pastors. Uh, Alaska. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I, I liked Pastor Alaska. And then I would say, well, I liked, um, you know, I liked, I don't know. Linda. Yeah, I was trying to think of how far back you want to go, right? Well, I like Gillespie. <laughs> I like Gillespie, right? I like the new guy. And then the others who have said, you know what? I just follow Jesus. <laughs> okay that's that's his argument right okay and and, and paul's point in, in in here is like no wait a minute there's no you can't distinguish between because is christ divided right was paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of paul right there there isn't he comes in the name of the lord jesus christ meaning the things that he does are not his but they're the lord's and he's only uh, if you like the instrument right he's the one who does it uh, for the lord so, and then this part just always makes me laugh. I just, I can't help. Because like I said, Paul is, he's a rhetorician. So he, he knows classical rhetoric and he uses all of it. Um, I don't even know it all. There, there's actually a, a professor of rhetoric at Patrick Henry College, who's a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Patrick Henry is a liberal arts college on the East Coast somewhere. Um, and he's been doing this work and he's threatening to write a book on it, on Paul's use of rhetoric of classical rhetoric because that's what he teaches and he sees it all in Paul all the time. And I heard a lecture once where he broke down some book, I can't remember which one from Paul and talked about this. Well, here now, Paul, he, he does like, um, it's called reductio ad absurdum. Have you ever heard that one? No. 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 So to re reduce thing, something into absurdity, is just a way to translate it literally into English, right? So to take an idea and then run it all the way out to its conclusion to the point where you're like, well, that's a really a dumb idea. <laughs> that's a rhetorical technique right you say well you know you know so-and-so jumped off the bridge and you're like well if everybody jumped off the bridge you know that that's that's it's that argument okay so um <laughs> i thank god that i baptized none of you except crispus and gaius 
so that I, no one may say that you were baptized in my name, right? So that's just a basic practical idea. But then he said, well, wait a minute, I did baptize the household of Stephanus. And actually, I don't even know. I probably baptized some other people too. <laughs> It's like, like, what what are you talking about? You don't remember who you baptized? I don't even know if I baptized anyone else. It's like, what what, what are you talking about? I think he's being funny. It's just saying, look, I'm not the one baptizing, right? He just takes the argument. He just runs it. It's probably actually not reductio absurdum. I don't know what what technique it is, but it's certainly funny. I don't even know. It's kind of like, um, I need to find this because actually somebody asked me about it. In one of his epistles, you know, he says, I don't, I know, I don't know of any um, accusation against me. And I, like, there, there were accusations from the rest of the apostles against Paul, his entire ministry. They never really accepted him. Um, they just let him go do his thing. And they just, as long as he didn't come to Jerusalem, it was all good. And <laughs> it's like, you know, of no, the people were upset with Paul all the time. We see this, but anyway. He says, I don't know any, I don't think anybody has any problem with me. Reminds me, well, no, that'd be a horrible thing to say. Kind of reminds me of Trump, you know, just his um, pomposity, you know, but anyway. All right. Yeah, that's, it is horrible to say, but he does not have a fake tan. So I'm sure. All right. See, there's me being funny. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So I don't, I think, I think what he's hinting at here, and we have to do this with all the epistles, is try to read into the context a little bit. Just try to determine, because he's not always explicit as to what exactly is going on. But sometimes you can get strong hints as to why are some people following Paul and other people Apollo, following Apollos and other Cephas or Peter, right? Is because of. Um, the way that they communicated, right? So like eloquent wisdom, um, you know, and it, it is very much like, well, I can understand what Pastor Gillespie says because maybe um, maybe you're like, you're a Gen Xer like me and you grew up with random abstract ideas and you don't mind stories moving all over the place and not having a linear, you know, train of thought, right? And so you're like, I love Pastor Gillespie, right? But then maybe you're more like Apollos and you're like, you need part A, part B, part C, conclusion, summary, you know, things really clear and direct. So um, Paul's point is that actually that isn't the point at all. That the cross of Christ is actually the power of salvation, the preaching of the gospel. Um, And that it is interesting here that he kind of, not neglects, but he kind of downplays baptism. Um, Because we would say baptism is the preaching of the gospel, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I, bat- I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a washing, a rebirth, and renewal. Yeah. That's why I'm surprised that he said, I, I'm not to baptize, but to preach. But after you preach, then you baptize because they believe. Yeah. And um, you, this is one of the most awkward things I think about, um, especially if you read the book of Acts, is that the practices of the churches are not uniform at the beginning. Right. And then um, as the church, like I said, with like hierarchical structure, then also as it spreads, they they tend to it tends to settle down and things become more similar in more places. It's not that everything's unified everywhere because they have to call church councils and resolve uh, pretty major differences, um, especially over the practical matters of the church. Um, But you do see you do see some unification um, and some and a doubling down or an emphasis upon especially um, baptism is it, it finds central pur- uh, purpose in the life of the church from almost from day one, especially as in the book of Acts, you see the, Peter says it at, at Pentecost, right? What must we do to be saved? They ask him and he says, believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. So, so that comes out right away. So they get baptism. Um, one of the things, and the reason why I wanted to study this book is that, the Lord's Supper in particular, it doesn't quite find consistency throughout the church um, until much later. So you're talking about, you know, 100, you know, 100, 200 years into the life of the church and the major controversies in the life of the church um, in the first five centuries of the church are over the Lord's Supper primarily. Uh, And then the doctrine of Christ as it's related to the Lord's Supper. So, um, hmm, 
but they don't have the same arguments about baptism except for in the Donatist controversy, which is another whole thing that we could talk about. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I wonder about this statement saying, well, he did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. You know, Paul has a kind of a particular or unique vocation, um, and that it's the local pastors who end up baptizing. Um, but Paul is like the, um, you know, he's, he's the missionary that comes in and preach the gospel, and then he kind of gets out of the way, and he lets the pastors do their job. He actually, you know, helps appoint them. So that's probably the best explanation, at least that I've read. Okay. All right. But here he gets to really to the point, um, you know, they're, they're to be united around the Lord Jesus Christ. We've gotten that theme a few different times. And now he says it here again, uh, referring to the cross of, of Christ. For the word of the cross um, is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now this is connected there were no paragraph breaks, by the way, in the original text, um, as well as no punctuation, which makes it <laughs> kind of fun to translate if you have an co original copy, um, you know, one of the autographs, because the, uh, you know, it would just, it would just go, it'd be a run on sentence. Christ be, be emptied of its power for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. So this idea of eloquent wisdom is, comes up right again in verse 18, this idea of folly. Uh, what's the word there? Amuria. Ooh, I don't know what that means, actually. I'd have to look that one up. But but folly, um, as in um, n not wisdom, right? But to those to those who are perishing. So those who are outside of faith, the cross makes no sense, which he's going to say in a couple more ways here as we move forward. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what, what Christ did upon the cross is the and this word is this is a great word this power word because it's dunamis which that's the root for uh, the english dynamite right <laughs> yeah so the cross is the dynamite of god if you want to think of it that way kind of it well it does it devastates it lays low you know anything that we put our pride or hope in and it leaves us only with god had to do that in order to save us oh <laughs> you know we don't have anything left to offer for it is written and where is this written Cited from Isaiah 29, <laughs> Job 5, J Jeremiah 8, Matthew 11. Okay. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Hmm. So uh, one thing I wanted to mention here as we looked at this is he's not, Paul's very careful uh, because again, he was schooled in, in, in all the liberal arts as we call them today uh, and that he, he does not downplay earthly wisdom. You know, being being wise, um, being virtuous, being noble, you know, um, loving your neighbor, doing what is right, right, seeking the good, um, examining one's heart, all the, all those ideas of of being what we would call, just call being a good person, you know, a decent person. He doesn't downplay that. He's not disputing that. What he's saying is that that wisdom um, cannot comprehend. God sending his son, Jesus, to die for us, and that that is the full and complete atonement for sins. It doesn't make, that's not wise in the way of the world, because earthly wisdom says, I've got to do what I need to do, um, you know, to shape up, to make, you know, to be a better person, to love my spouse, or, or to care for my children, or, you know, um, well, I mean, think about it right now. Um, <laughs> we, we need to be wise in how we um, live out our life as a church, um, because it's a kind of, a, we're, we're in a kind of a complicated place. We, we don't want to spread a disease, right? But we also don't want to anger earthly authorities or dishonor them, especially, but even anger them or draw unnecessary offense, um, by, you know, getting impatient and, you know, pushing the envelope as to what might actually be appropriate right now. Um, we don't, we, we actually can't be wise in our action because we don't have the information we need. To be wise, right? We don't we don't know about well. We have better idea today than we did say four weeks ago as to what you know how the disease is spread or how effective our measures are, like um, social distancing or wearing masks or all the hygienic stuff. We have a better idea. We don't know how long people are contagious. We don't know what what would be another thing that we lack wisdom. Oh, we don't know um, whether you're immune after you've um, been infected by the virus, right? 
So we can't actually act with wisdom because we don't have uh, what he called, what did he call it earlier in the text here? Uh, what was it? Knowledge? Yeah, speech and knowledge, right? We don't have this, this gnosis, this knowledge to actually act with wisdom. Now, in the, in the terms of the cross, um, the knowledge and, that gives us the wisdom of the cross is actually the word of God. It's not earthly knowledge. It's not scientific knowledge. It's not observable knowledge. But it's it's the um, the testimony of the eyewitness disciples. You know. All right. Now I've said a lot. Did uh, did that get some creative thought juices going? Yes. Okay. What do you want to yeah. say, Don? No, I just it, it, it makes you think. Okay. Good. All right. Thought juices meaning getting you to think is that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I was I I going to get you to say something, but that's okay. Too. Yeah. All right. Uh, no, it's fine. This, this format, I mean, yeah, it's probably actually not that much different than a live Bible study. Um, unless you come being an expert in the book and then you can dialogue with me as, you know, somebody who's studied it extensively. Actually, then you probably know it better than I do. Um, anyway, where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? All right. So these are the kind of people that, that give wisdom, um, the scribes, right? Those are the people who, who copy the book and by copying it, they, they learn it by heart. Okay. Uh, where's the debater? This is the, the public rhetoric. Uh, like we see with Paul when he debates um, at the Areopagus in Acts with all of the, all of the, um, well, I don't know, I guess we call them philosophers there, but they're with pagan gods. So, that's yeah. what NIV, my NIV version, in, instead of debater, uses philosopher. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it's sudzetetes. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't, I have to look that word up too. I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, screen sharing pausing, screen sharing non-paused. Okay, good. Yeah, debater. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about, but that will come up often here in the book, and I think it was Luther in his introduction that made this distinction, is that um, the world, of, even in, in Paul's context, the world of philosophy and the world of religion are, are kept apart. And, and they, the philosophers mock the religious as being kind of superstitious. The religious mock the philosophers as um, being too worldly and not, and not uh, supernatural enough. And so that's, this is one of the really cool things about St. Paul. I, don't, I think it does make him a little bit more challenging, but it also is, is really great because he integrates um, both um, the use of reason and sense, but but that reason and sense being subject um, to the revelation of God, all right? And so he's not superstitious, but he's also, he, he knows when to submit to the word of God, right? And to say, okay, behold, a mystery, he will say, regards to um, uh, marriage, actually, he calls it a mystery, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, uh, husband and wife live together in union lifelong what yeah that is a mystery how that works and then um but but in in terms of i mean he's using wisdom here to make an argument right so so his wisdom has been sub, um, sub made subject to um a dialogue about actually trusting in in their baptism and in, in namely in the cross of christ and the power of god there all right so has not god made foolish the wisdom of this of the world all right for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. <laughs> I mean, just the this is a, this is logic and rhetoric here. Okay, so he's making a logical argument and he's doing it with with clever rhetoric. The wisdom of God is put against the world, the world's wisdom, which could not know God. What they have is not wisdom at all. In other words, because it pleased God through the folly, which is actually wisdom, of what we preach. To save those who believe. All right, maybe I have to do that again. It's the wisdom of God that He sent preachers to preach what is wise in God's eyes, but which is folly to the world, and that the world could never know through its what it calls wisdom, which is actually folly. <laughs> I, don't know I, I don't know if I did, the, did a good job of that, but that's what He's playing with, right? What is wise? What is folly? And in there, there He's putting them at odds. And then he will tease it out here a little bit more. All right. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Um, ironically, he's talking to, to people in a Roman society, but he's thinking of ancient Greeks. So he's, you know, Plato, Aristotle. 
which the Romans knew quite well. But we preach, all right, not signs, not wisdom, but Christ crucified. So this is preached, uh, the kerygma, uh, or what's the, Caruso is in Greek. What's the other word that I was thinking of here? Proclamation. Yeah, we proclaim what is. Not something you can seek, not something you can demand, but what is, Christ crucified, which then becomes, because it's preached, a stumbling block to the Jews who are demanding signs and folly to Gentiles who are seeking wisdom. Because how can one man dying for the sins of the world be wise? And how could actually God dying for, for man? Because what should happen is man dies for God, right? But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, whether they're Jews or Greeks, uh, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, right? So you see that's the, the, the uh, continuation of that theme from verse 21, where he's playing with folly and wisdom there, all right? For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, or than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So it doesn't make any sense. And, and that's the whole point. It doesn't, it's not about making sense. It's actually about what is true and what is not. All right, if that makes sense. Um, so, let me just think how we want to, yeah, we're getting up towards the time I want to do. Well, we're almost done with the chapter. We can finish it out, I think. Sure. Yeah. Four, consider your calling. So that word calling, um, we talked about calling before, didn't we? Yeah, that was at the very beginning of the book. I don't want to scroll too fast because it probably looks horrible on your end. But uh, remember, he said it right here at the beginning, called to be saints together with all those of every place. And then I think he repeated it again, didn't he? Yes. Um, do you see it? Call yeah. upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There, verse two again. Oh yeah, here called it is. Yeah, called, called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, in verse nine. And then there was another one, wasn't there? I should have highlighted it. All right. Um, but... But he goes back to that theme, you've been called, you're calling. We, we use the word vocation, but the calling he means here is not like an earthly vocation. He means um, as children of God, right? Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards or, or worldly, um, worldly standards, really? Ugh. Uh, that should be according to the flesh. I don't know why they translated it that way. All right, so you're not wise according to the flesh. Meaning these aren't even smart people that he's talking to. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. All right. So this was common um, in, the, in, in the Christian community. I mean, there was a, there was a, a diversity of, of Christians. For example, they would meet um, usually in a, we have this archaeologically actually proven out, that they would meet in a wealthy person's home who had maybe like a large courtyard or a large gathering space that they could use uh, for their church. Um, but he does note that not many of them it, it tended to appeal um, to the, in Greek, the hoi polloi, you know, the, the common people. We call it the, uh, in French, what? The bourgeois? <laughs> Bourgeoisie. <laughs> yeah, what do we say in English? I don't even know. Uh, the riffraff? The, the riffraff? <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, it is true that there were, there were people that were notoriously um, not great people. Um, I don't know. The, guy, the people at the bars. Anyways, uh, we're not at the bars now, so I don't even know what they're doing. I can't even imagine. I mean, if you live your life at the bar, I, I'm just wondering, like, what do you do now? I guess you drink at home. Maybe you have a bar at home. I don't know. At least in Wisconsin, they decided not to ban alcohol, right? You could still buy alcohol. <laughs> that would imagine. I mean, you'd have people like driving their cars to, to Madison and, and yeah, <laughs> it would be terrible. Just a protest. Um, I think Michigan there. All right, so God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, which is just an interesting expression, right? Um, even even those, uh, the things that are, are, are worthless, actually, in the eyes of the world, to bring to nothing things that are, right? So we, we have this whole big reversal. You know, what is wise in the eyes of the world is actually folly in God's eyes, right? Seeking God, seeking wisdom, seeking signs. That's not, that's actually folly when it comes to salvation. Um, uh, you know, that he uses, he uses a death actually to bring about life for the world. Right? That, that actually isn't wise at all. Um, 
and that no human being, no, there's that translations again, that no flesh, why did I translate it as human being? Because you see worldly standards, wise according to the flesh, and now that no flesh might boast in the presence of God. I don't know. I guess they're trying to make it make more sense, but this idea of flesh, we know that from Paul. Talking about the works of the flesh are evident, right? That when we talk about the flesh, that's that's our sinful nature. So why they would say worldly standards and human beings. Oh, and the ESV here. Oh, oh well, so it is. Uh, no one can boast in the presence of God. We've got nothing, right? Not noble birth, not powerful, not worldly standards. What's, what's yours got there, Don? What do you have for your translation in verse 29? Uh, instead nine. of human being, it just says one, so that no one might boast. Yeah, okay. That's still not quite that. Let me go look at this other translation. I'm, Hold on. I'm concerned. Human being is flesh. Worldly standards is human being standards, not, not of God. Right. Why right. is it? So awful that oh yeah no that's a good question um and i i kind of alluded to it but i didn't actually explain so um when paul talks about flesh this is more clear in both romans and galatians um but he he is consistent through all of his epistles that when he when he uses the word for flesh which in greek is sarx by the way um that he is referring um to to sinful humanity He's not referring to um, the Christian or the, the child of God or, or the baptized. He's referring, he's referring to the sinful um, character of, of humanity, right? So when he says worldly standards, he's talking about, you know, he's, he's not, yeah, he's, he's not talking about the Christian. He's talking about, um, he's talking about what you're born with. Okay. Well, um, so it's, it's, we're just losing some clarity if if they had translated it as sarks, then we would make the connections to where else he re- translates sarks as flesh. Okay. So it's one of the things that the particularly in the English Standard Version, um, which kind of got shoehorned into the Missouri Synod, but that's a long story for another time. Um, the translators they're they're largely not um, <laughs> they're not sacramental people. I'll just put it that way. So. So they don't actually, these, they come from traditions that don't celebrate. Uh, they don't actually believe that Christ is bodily present in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, for example. And so they, they actually, in their translations, because their theological presupposition, they, they downplay um, bodily existence, not only um, in our relationship to one another, but also that Christ is bodily present for us um, through his word and through his sacraments. And why they do that, that's, a, that's more philosophy probably than it is theology, but, um, but it tends to affect the translation. So they'll, they'll move away, they'll move into kind of a, more of an abstraction when, when he says sarks. And there, that word can be used in other ways. So uh, in fairness to them, um, they're, they're saying, well, uh, we're going to prefer a different, um, a different translation. But why you would do that in the same paragraph is interesting to me right as they set this paragraph that here they translate the same word as worldly standards that they later translate as human being um, why not okay. use use the same word so that you make the connection between those two expressions as paul would have us do i think go ahead barb i'm sorry well it's because you know the original word mm-hmm. we don't so right. i guess it doesn't seem that particular it does talk about, you know, the human flesh, so to speak, in both of them. As right. That. Right. Well, and so what, what I'm trying to suggest, I mean, maybe, maybe this is a complicated argument, um, but that Paul would, would have you make the connection between uh, wise according to worldly standards and that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He wants you to connect those two, which is why okay. he uses the same word in both places. But when the translator uses a, translates it differently, then it's harder to see that connection in English yes. that, that Paul intended and that was clear in the Greek. So um, my, okay. preferen- my preference is that the translator actually translate consistently so that we actually can make the connections. There's other places that this happens. Um, oh, this, the most notorious example is um, the English Standard Version translates the text as, blessed are those um, who hear the word of God and obey it. 
but earlier in that same, um, you know, stayings from Jesus and that same, that same pericope, that same story, he says, they say that we keep the word. And then at the end, they say, obey it. Now, why would you translate the same word? Oh. It's actually the same word. Why would you translate it as, as not keep in both places or to keep near or to treasure actually is a good way to, to translate that word. Why would you translate it as obey at the end? Unless your theological um, um, <laughs> presupposition here is that the word is given to us to obey rather than to actually hear and to take to heart, as Luther would call it. Say okay. right. I can yeah. See that. yeah, so that's another example of this kind of um, inconsistency in translation. I'm going to move my okay. screen here a little bit because I want to see, I wanted to see what uh, New King James did. Yeah, so New King James, this is why I'm so, I was a little disturbed. It translates it this way. Not many were wise according to the flesh. And then in verse 29, that no flesh should glory in, the, in his presence. So that's one of the reasons I tend to prefer New King James because they, they do that. They translate consistently. Um, and that's because the translators of New King James Bible tend to actually be sacramental people. So they do care about this word flesh quite a bit. All right. So good question, Barb. And, uh, and then the last statement. And because of him, and the Greek it says, and from him. So again, they even tell you here in the ESV, we didn't translate it literally. Um, you, are, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Uh, this, is a, this is a beautiful statement right here. And if we're going to latch on to one thing tonight, I think this is the thing to latch on to, is that Jesus is actually everything. He is wisdom, he's truth, he's life, he's love, he's righteousness, he's sanctification, he's redemption. None of this, none of this is, is actually comes from man. It's all given to us. Um, from him, right? And, and especially sanctification, this is a constant, ah, well, ever since Luther, actually, and Luther's students, they've been, we've been arguing about this as Lutherans for uh, our entire history, and we argue with other churches about it, too, because we don't, you know, just internal arguments are only so much fun, so then you got to get other people involved. <laughs> it's saying, well, um, you know, are you made holy by the work of the Holy Spirit, um, through the preaching of the word and the, and the administration of the sacraments, or is is holiness uh, either in part or in entirely the work of man, so that we um, receive the word of God and then, like we were talking about with that other text, I can't remember what the expression is, but you know that we obey it, that we do it. So um, you look at the hymns in the sanctification section in your hymnal, and one of the problems here is that I have to do these at home because the internet at church is pretty much worthless right now, and um, because everybody's using it. Not our internet, but we're all sharing the same tower. If you look at the sanctification section, thankfully I have a hymnal here is what I was going to say. I normally, this is, this office, don't do church stuff in here. Um, there's not very many hymns. And this bothers people. And I have to, I, see, I can't even find it because it's so, uh, trust. Uh, there it is. Sanctification, it's late 600. So it starts... 683 and then following right and you say to be sanctified is to be made holy right it's actually a passive it has a passive sense is that you're made holy meaning someone actually makes you holy and we believe third article of the creed it's the holy spirit but we read that when we read the hymns in the hymnal they're not always clear about this um and it you you have to look and see who's the subject of the sentence and then who's the who's doing the the verb then right so for example you know this is a this is a good one uh, oh holy spirit grant us grace that we are lord and savior in faith and fervent love embrace and truly serve him ever right so we embrace we um, in faith love and we serve him but how did it start give us jesus give us grace you know that we follow right so without the holy spirit's giving there's no there's no love, there's no service, there's no faith, okay? So sometimes the hymns do a really good job, and other times it's like, well, uh, what's one that you could probably misunderstand? Oh, yeah, um, let us ever walk with Jesus, right? Because the, it starts, I'm not, I actually don't have a problem with the hymn, but it, <laughs> but it starts, let us. So just grammatically, when we hear that, 
it sounds like, okay, now we're the ones, right, who have to do the walking. It, well, then it even goes on, follow his example, pure, all right? That the world would not deceive us into our sin and spirits alert, onward as foots of turn pilgrims here above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's building. Actually, oh, does he actually ever say that it's Jesus that actually does the work, that does the sanctifying? Hmm. Yeah, actually, well, here's one expression. Jesus, here I share your woe. Help me there your joy to know. So there you give a little credit to Jesus. There's probably more in there. Jesus, here, oh yeah, it puts it at the end of every stanza. Jesus, here with you I die, there to live with you on high. Jesus, let me faithful be, life eternal grant to me. All right? The, the challenge is grammatically is it just, it starts out with all the things that we do in response to what, what Jesus has given us, the faith that he's given us. And so, uh, you know, the hymn doesn't, it's not lying. It just doesn't have the whole picture. And then uh, what happened amongst Lutherans is then, then uh, we argue about this and say, well, no, actually sanctification is our work that's done in response to what Jesus did for us. But here, Paul is very clear. says, uh, no, actually, he's your wisdom. He's truth. He's your righteousness. He forgives you. He makes you holy by the forgiveness of sins. He redeems you, saves you from sin, death, and hell. He does the whole thing. Right, and you don't want anything to boast about. <laughs> you have nothing to be proud about, nothing uh, to claim as your own. Um, let the one who boasts, quoting Jeremiah nine, boast in the Lord. All right, does that make sense on the sanctification topic? Yes. Yeah. Well, and this is real. This is going to be really important in the book because he's he's going to be telling the church of Corinth to shape up, to do better. Right. But if he hadn't laid this all out to say, um, no, actually. It, it, this is not going to come from your own heart. This is not come. I'm not going to be able to make an argument from wisdom. Um, this is actually, this is going to require you to be faithful to your calling, to consider your calling, to think of who you are as God's child, to, to treat one another as children of God, to love one another as those who have been redeemed, um, you know, forgiven by Jesus, right? Rather than um, make like clever arguments or try to find loopholes or, you know, you're going to have to sit down and you're going to have to realize, what is it that we have in common here? Oh, it's faith in Christ. All right, let's start there. Um, and then and maybe even he'll make this argument. I can't remember where. I think chapter 13, maybe. Um, that uh, you might have to actually set aside things that, that are perfectly acceptable for us to do as Christians, for example, or to do in a Christian congregation, but not push the envelope or not, not you know, beg the question for a time. Um, because of those who are weak in the faith, right? So that, that'll come out too. All right. So I've said a lot. Um, I actually didn't think we'd get through chapter one, but we did all right. And that's about as long as I wanted to go. So We did good. We did good. So uh, yeah, invite your friends, neighbors, whatever. Um, and we'll, we'll get them to join in. And I don't have any idea how well the recording worked. So if 